Okay, welcome back everyone to Peeling to Barrett. This will be our conclusions episode, our final episode. And in this episode, I kind of want to do a few things. Uh, the first is, of course, to rehash the career of Mr. Barrett and uh, some of our discussions about him. And uh, secondarily, I want to run through some kind of takeaways for me personally um, from my review of, of Mr. Barrett. And uh, perhaps those will apply to you, perhaps not. But um, uh, I do think that at some point in time, after a person has reviewed enough material, it's time to generate opinion, to make takeaways. And of course, everything in life is an opinion. So a lot of people will say, of course, well, that's your opinion. But there's a difference between an educated opinion and an ignorant opinion in my in my uh from my point of view that if you have spent time reviewing material eventually you get a sense of the material and you have to be able to have takeaways and incorporate that into your life somehow and uh, how a person chooses to do that is uh, formulated around a general feel for what the information is relaying and that is of course an opinion of sorts it is an opinion that is formulated uh, ideally with insight, but also with a strong background or foundation that is laid within the confines of review of work, a review of information. And uh, that's what I wanted to do with this series. I wanted to review the information, not just of Mr. Barrett, but as you can tell, if you've been following the contextual elements that surrounded Mr. Barrett from the subterraneans, to the poets of that age. We've tried to do a very, very simple review and uh, get a feel for kind of what was happening at that point in time. And I think it's appropriate now for us to have a, just kind of a finale to discuss things. Uh, and, I'm, and I have to confess that this uh, finale I've been considering in my head for quite some time because I really want to run through a number of topics and it's not easy to do so. Um, I, I, again, I don't have everything written down that I want to talk about. I have basic points that I'd like to run through, but um, to really formulate things and have everything written out line by line, I feel is disingenuous and I don't want to do that. I want to be able to talk things through freely and I'll attempt to do so in this episode and hopefully it'll give value to people that are listening. So. Uh, first off, the first thing I want to do is mention we had some new folks sign up and subscribe. Thanks for doing that. This is the last episode of this series. I do plan on continu continuing the Did Sid series, so I don't know how many episodes of that I'm going to do. If you're just following uh, my channel for the Sid Barrett stuff, um, I do intend to continue making at least, I don't know, maybe eight 10 episodes of uh, Did Sid, we will see, where I try to track the influences of Mr. Barrett. The extent of that um, would likely be things like T-Rex, The Beatles, Genesis, Zeppelin, Hendrix, The Stones. There's a lot of, of people, including up to like The Cure, bands that I feel have at least had some influence of Mr. Barrett. And if you've been following along with the Did Sid uh, series... Uh, I, I think you could say that uh, it's reasonable, at least now, with that review, to say perhaps he was working with other artists after after he kind of retired and went into uh, uh, seclusion. So uh, let's give a call out or a shout out real quick to a number of people that I feel indebted to for helping me make this series that have uh, given me comments and sometimes insight into uh, ideas and topics and I feel um, it's appropriate to note them and to give them my thanks. Whether they agreed with me or not on, on discussions is irrelevant. Uh, the fact that people are willing to engage in a discussion on uh, this topic is important to me. And it helped me to finish this series. So uh, let me give a shout out to them. Uh, Brian Graham, Steve Brosco, I believe is how you pronounce the last name. Sorry, Steve, if I mispronounced your last name. Trudy Hughes, uh, Voices, 
And uh, Voices, I have not forgotten your comment. I'm going to use it in Did See the Wall, which will probably be my next episode. Sudarshana, who has been uh, helping me from the beginning. So thank you very much, Sudarshana. Renewed Poet, who uh, got on a little bit later, but uh, was quite interactive. Jose Lamsfus, who gave me a number of insights. Thank you, Jose. Sifa Sifa, who has been um, helping a lot and has uh, given me some notes on, on some topics and uh, also uh, given me some positive feedback, so I appreciate that very much. Paisley, who uh, I haven't seen on for a while, but uh, was, she was commenting early on and uh, was, um, I, I guess you could say, uh, inspirational in some ways to continue on with the series when I just started out. Domine, who's uh, given me a number of, of great discussions. And then uh, finally, Motor B1 TCH. So uh, all of you, I want to say thanks for contributing to the channel in some way, even if that's just with discussions about uh, feelings on the topics. I hope that this is something that uh, you've enjoyed, that is uh, something that you can feel that you helped um, create in some ways because you did, even if you uh, perhaps aren't aware of that. So uh, what exactly did I intend to do with this when I started out? Well, I don't know entirely. What I did know was that most people that were making reviews of Mr. Barrett and his work and of Pink Floyd in general were doing extremely superficial reviews and I did not appreciate that. I did not think that they were reflective of the intelligence and capabilities of Mr. Barrett and in fact many of them were quite dismissive of facts and were uh, I guess you could say willfully ignorant of a number of things that are alternate possibilities and so I felt that it was necessary for me to put this together because I wasn't getting what I wanted uh, through this medium and we have to recognize the importance of this medium in that people quite often are watching and getting information from this medium if they're not getting factual information and considerate information or considered information then it's doing them a disservice in many ways and in uh, not only doing disservice to the artists that are involved but also doing a disservice to the general population by uh, contributing to uh, invalid in information or unknown information or unbacked opinion and formulating uh, stereotypes and preconceived notions about one another and about other people and for me that's a very dangerous thing so I, I wanted to put this together to review Mr. Barrett and in doing so uh, provide a format for people to consider one another and to consider the nature of larger things and hopefully uh, I've succeeded on some level in doing that. I've made a lot of mistakes on the way I know I have and so uh, I do apologize for uh, the format if it's something that has been distracting to you in some ways but uh, this is something that's comfortable for me and it was the only way I could think of putting it together that uh, made a lot of sense. So. Uh, Let's go ahead then, and I want to discuss the themes that we have been developing within Mr. Barrett's music, and we'll draw conclusions, and we will see if perhaps we can make some sense, and perhaps answer some questions about Mr. Barrett um, as far as we can. Again, we can't know things about Mr. Barrett, we just kind of have to guess. Uh, he did a number of interviews that provide us some information, and he had a body of work. So uh, let's discuss a number of things. So the first theme that we kind of discuss is the male-female inversion kind of idea. And, um, of course, Mr. Barrett is uh, described as being this, you know, beautiful person in a number of uh, interviews. We've discussed that thoroughly. Uh, I don't really understand totally what is intended by that, but I do know that um, that's at least in the U.S., calling someone beautiful is, is a female kind of a trait. A male trait would be handsome or rugged or whatever people want to say. So uh, you have a whole follow-up of musicians, of course, that kind of do this dolled-up kind of a look from uh, Mark Bolin of T-Rex um, 
to David Bowie, the kind of androgynous look that catches on after Mr. Barrett. You could say that that's a trendsetter. But what is the intent of that? Of course, uh, it could be intrinsically tied to sexuality. And we've mentioned, of course, that Mr. Barrett may have had a fluid form of sexuality. Again, we can't know something like that. He never really discussed that topic. Uh, whether that's bothersome to some people or not, I don't know. And frankly, I don't really care. I, I feel that the work itself, the music itself, the poetry itself, and whatever Mr. Barrett wanted to present himself as, is totally up to the artist involved. So uh, we have mentioned the possibility of the backdrop of politics at the time. And of course, in the 60s was uh, largely tied up with this greater movement of people towards freedom and equality. So, of course, the male-female inversion may be a, a form of equality expression or an expression of a desire for equality that's politically motivated. I just throw that out there uh, again. Now, we've reviewed Mr. Barrett's work. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of political expression in it, but there is politics tied up within the beat poets and uh, within men like Kerouac and the Subterraneans, it is quite evident. And we've mentioned the many influences that are, that are possible and even likely with Mr. Barrett. So it's possible that he's expressing something like that. The second theme that uh, we discussed is a, a form of sexual metaphor or innuendo within his lyrics. Now, uh, for some people, Perhaps in Europe, that's not that big of a deal. But in the United States, of course, we're kind of a puritanical society, in spite of the fact that we have a, a, a an overly sensualized uh, medium like film and whatever else. The average U.S. citizen, in my opinion, is quite removed from um, that type of experience. So I'll just give you an example. If you consider the amount of time per day that a person spends considering the nature of intercourse versus the nature of playing games and gaming and in particular violent gaming, the vast majority of time within a person's life that is an average U.S. citizen is spent uh, much more considering things like money. Uh, and I don't mean greed money. I mean like paying the bills kind of money and uh, playing games or violence or whatever versus actual considered uh, intercourse and enjoyment of relations between a person and their significant other or just in general. And in a way, I fear that that's kind of a reflection of the removal of beauty of life, the enjoyment of the creative process, uh, which is... Uh, something that, of course, was called out uh, by Mr. Unamuno in Spain just prior to the Spanish uh, Civil War uh, and prior to World War II. So for that reason, it's very disturbing to me to consider that people seem to spend more of their time enjoying destructive things than enjoying creative things and recognizing the beauty of, of those things. Just my opinion. So, um, the third item that he kind of brings up, the theme that we discuss is the king-queen royal kind of idea. Of course, it's possible in some ways that Mr. Bird is expressing the idea or the ideal of becoming some kind of king of rock and roll. It could be just that simple. Uh, there also may be some form of uh, religious expressions there. We've mentioned the, the possible Christian themes within his music and, in my opinion, the likely Christian themes that he makes within his music. Another topic uh, or another theme that we kind of discussed with the, Mr. Barrett's music is the uh, young or psychological review of animal uh, metaphor, which of course is quite prominent within Mr. Barrett's music. Uh, this is important to me because uh, the, the discussion internally of the animal metaphor uh, and other forms of metaphors is intrinsic to a person's ability to understand themselves and to understand their own dreams. So uh, 
in my opinion, every person should be considering those things and eventually moving on to do them on their own, add that to their life. So uh, whether or not it's important to understand Mr. Barrett's take on those things, uh, which of course is is necessary if you're going to understand a song like Effervescing Elephant, in my opinion. The point of that exercise really is to open up that world to people that have not experienced it because without understanding the metaphor within ourselves and within our uh, subconscious, it's very difficult to understand our own dreams. And every person should, if they wish to become a spiritually developed, wise person, in my opinion, should go through that process on a daily basis. Um, anyway, that's that's my take on that. Now, another theme is a kind of a, a shy slash dismissive slash misogynistic tone in a number of his songs. Uh, we have discussed that kind of at length. It's difficult, of course, to separate things out. And Mr. Barrett seemed to be quite a reserved person. It is quite possible that... Uh, that he is someone that was not very good at expressing kind of what he wanted or what he felt. This is an, this is in many ways a negative aspect of many men, that we are very bad at expressing how we feel and what is important to us. And in a way that backfires on men because uh, uh, we are not able to keep the things that are very important to us and quite often uh, the things and the people that are important to us don't know that they're important to us. And in a way, society makes this problem worse by portraying a stereotype of men as being uh, emotionless and incapable of being wounded. And just in general, if someone is going to believe that a person has a heart of stone, uh, then they're going to be much more callous with that person because they believe that that person can't be hurt anyway. So it really doesn't matter if they're nice or mean to them anyway. And that stereotype of male is, is quite incorrect in my experience. Um, of course, everyone can be quite cruel. But the idea of the separation of sexes, that women are these uh, extremely loving and caring people, which is a stereotype, but men are really strong and and um, they don't have emotions or shouldn't show emotions, is another form of a stereotype. Those Both of those stereotypes are quite wrong. There are different ways of expressing things and you can make general statements about, um, about sexes if you wish to divide people, but the truth of the matter is, in my opinion, that some people are simply more expressive than others more easily expressive but almost every person has feelings it's very rare that a person doesn't have feelings at all so um it it explains i think a bit of this shy slash dismissive slash misogynistic tone that perhaps mr barrett is struggling with not only the uh, the liberation movement and the empowerment of uh of women, but also a number of perhaps failed relationships, which are referred to in his music, that uh, perhaps he was uh, wounded by uh, quite deeply and was unable to find any form of support regarding those after they had failed. And perhaps they failed, you know, because of him. And perhaps he was uh, a bit inflexible and caused their failure in his own way. And perhaps he was unable to learn from that and change over time. I don't know. Uh, but that tone does seem to run through a number of his songs. And it is somewhat explainable and understandable. Now the uh, torn attraction slash lost, lost love we've somewhat discussed. Of course, anyone who's been through relationships that have, has failed, have failed, will feel attraction uh, and be quite conflicted by it, not only because a portion of themselves is still dedicated to other people, but also because they recognize that the potential pain of a future failure uh, will only worsen their condition. And so many times they'll be reluctant to uh, stay positive and try out new things. But in my opinion, that has to continue in order for life to be full. Uh, there is a natural grieving process 
and uh, people that have gone through depression or depressionary episodes uh, will eventually pass through them, uh, the vast majority, and will find new and positive things, and those new and positive things will eventually um, move on. And uh, it's very difficult for some people to understand or stay open to that experience, but uh, that really is something that is wonderful about kids that they, they view all new experiences as wonderful, potentially positive, and um, perhaps that's a lesson, you know, that, that we need to learn from children constantly is, is that their open-eyed wonder at the world is something that is invaluable and is quite important to being a functioning adult. Uh, <clears throat> the next theme that is discussed is kind of this changing religious or esoteric beliefs. Now, uh, this is something that perhaps, uh, now it's very difficult to know this with Mr. Barrett, but one thing we do know is that he seemed to be sampling from a number of religions and eventually formulating his own form of uh, belief set. And for me, that's an Im incredibly important thing for, for every person to do in order to have a spiritual life and to have a daily spiritual life that impacts their daily decisions so um, it's very, very easy to go to church for one hour every week and show up and give $5 or whatever. And I, I'm, I'm not going to say that that's a bad thing, but I will say that that's an empty thing. That And people seem to be recognizing that because so many folks are kind of leaving religion, not, not least of which is being caused by... a. a a lot of, I don't want to say corruption, but there's a lot of stories right now about problems within organized churches, so, and abuse within those churches and within a lot of belief systems. So how can that be changed? I've, I've, I've mentioned before that I'm a religious person, or I should say a spiritual person, perhaps not a religious person. Uh, for me, the way to avoid that is by people becoming directly involved in their own development and to take responsibility for their own development and to allow that development to occur and to allow that development in whatever way that it's going to go so long as it's a positive way and uh that's a very kind of a that's a very kind of a sketchy thing uh that's a very a potentially problematic thing for people that perhaps are sliding down a a path that uh, or a slippery slope that is not only a, a little bit deranged but also a little bit twisted and they're unable to kind of rely on other people to help them but um, I'm not sure how to get around that one that's kind of a that's kind of a tricky one the point is that uh, in a way mr. bird is kind of showing for me, a way of developing a person's religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs on their own so that they can uh, experience things like dream interpretation and consider the larger framework of other religious belief sets uh, and meld those together in their own way and develop their own form of religion, which I think is, is a very wonderful and rewarding thing to do. The next theme that we discussed is alienation and separation, particularly uh, with friends and family. And that one I think is quite self-explanatory that uh, Mr. Barrett had lost a number of friends, that he had had a number of failed relationships, and that he was even separated from his own family uh, while he was uh, operating in London and was part of the music scene. Now, um, Perhaps for some people that wouldn't really be that mm, big of a deal, but of course for some people that are already quite uh, um, introspective and inward looking, losing too many things that are uh, foundations for security is, is not always a very positive thing. Okay, uh, the next theme is, is drug and psychedelic references. Uh, my takeaways from this actually is that this is kind of overstated. 
Uh, there are a number of what could be considered to be drug and psychedelic references within the music, but as we have mentioned, of course, there are numerous uh, references to dreaming, and it is very different, or very difficult, I should say, to separate the psychedelic references from dream references. So, uh, in my opinion, the psychedelic references to Mr. Barrett may be a little bit overblown. And although he very likely was participating in drug use to some degree in the 60s, which shouldn't surprise anyone, I would actually argue that uh, his struggles and difficulties may be quite similar to what a lot of people are going through now and that is opiate addiction. There are numerous references to opiates within his music, and uh, many people within the medical field, within, the, within uh, the medical professions, will argue that opiates are by far and away far more dangerous than psychedelic drugs. And so the entire discussion of uh, psychedelic drug use uh, causing mental breakdown and everything within Mr. Barrett may be overblown and uh, the uh, one of the stories that may be more important is that this is a person who is trying to overcome opiate addiction on his own without support and um, without the uh, benefit of modern uh, modern drugs that have been developed to help fight opiate addiction to some degree now this is all shown within the, the film War, and this may actually explain the use of psychedelics uh, by, by someone like the main character in the film War, and that is to break the chain of dependence on opiate, uh, on opiates, and uh, that's all discussed within that film. So I just want to throw that one out there, that that's something that <clears throat> I learned about during the course of this. and. That's a takeaway that I'm having. Um, there are the next theme is uh, the numerous references of colors and paint that should not surprise anyone. What surprises me is that so many other people during this time frame are making very similar kinds of assessments. There seems to be a kind of a uh, an overarching pattern of people that are copying this or perhaps. Uh, he's just doing the same thing of incorporating sensation within music, which is, I, I think, quite wonderful. Uh, the next thing we discussed is the idea of travel and flying. We've already discussed dreams. I'm not going to go into this too much, but of course, these are both very important thing within dreams. Uh, again, I've, as I've mentioned, I have not uh, utilized psychedelic drugs, so uh, this entire experience to me is unknown. And perhaps it's quite uh, important to the people that partake in it. Uh, again, as I have mentioned, I consider myself to be a Christian. I ha have had a very personal Christian experience earlier in my life. And for me, that was transformative. And um, I already have very vivid dreams uh, almost on a nightly basis. And I keep track of all of them and consider them every morning. So for me, this idea of traveling and flying uh, is more of a dream reference, and uh, perhaps that's not true with everyone, but uh, for me that is true. So I, I don't feel the need to partake in psychedelic drugs. Um, the next thing that we mention is the idea of hidden sorrow, which is, I guess you could say, kind of tied to the idea of torn attraction and lost love, and if so, the amount of instances combined of those would be 37, which is astonishing. So, in my opinion, the most references within Mr. Barrett's music are to his emotional state. His emotional state is what I would consider to be damaged. So, this idea of hidden sorrow, torn attraction, and lost love permeates his music. It is extremely um, prevalent. And is denoting, in my opinion, someone who has been who has been emotionally damaged and recognizes that, is channeling that within his music and is perhaps trying to heal, or perhaps uh, trying to self-express and create art with what they know. Of course, um, sad songs are are 
more pop, I guess you could say. That's part of the reason, perhaps, why someone like Adele is making a lot of sad songs. Um, and it's very common to do so in rock and roll and in pop music. But I have to admit that um, the, both of these albums have a lot of songs that aren't really uh, what I would consider to be pop songs. And so you, you have to think that what Mr. Baird is doing is simply relaying what he's experiencing, which is a little bit depressing. <sighs> Unfortunately, each person has to go through that set of depressions um, and considerations of their own kind of I don't want to say failure, but it, it is damaging experience, at least in the short term, on their own, and they have to process that on their own. And hopefully they understand that when they come out the other side of that process, that they'll be stronger, they'll be better, and that uh, there is a potential always for things to get better again. I, I suspect Mr. Barrett knew that, and uh, hopefully what he did with his career indicates kind of a, a way for people to process negativity in their life and eventually make art of it and move on and live a full life which would be a great lesson for for any person to to learn the next theme that we discuss is the sun stars and planets uh, I won't go into that too much uh, it's difficult really to know in my opinion if that's an esoteric kind of a discussion that he's having I'm not overly familiar with uh, ast astrology, so I, I don't have a whole lot to say about this topic. I don't consider myself to be well educated on this matter. Um, the next theme is a combination of low and high art within Mr. Barrett's work. This, this uh, includes both his painting and also his music and his poetry in particular, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's extremely human. It, it shows an honesty towards experience. By that, I mean the artist is not trying to uh, only choose what other people would perhaps be awed by, or they are not only considering what, what is already accepted art. What they are doing is taking all experiences of low and high art and processing that and creating something new with that that is uh, unique to their own experience which really is in my opinion uh, a keystone of art uh, the next theme we have is uh, Shakespeare Tolkien and James Joyce references now there are so many um, different people that have potentially influenced Mr. Barrett we've gone into this through our series so uh, I hope that uh, you're able to to kind of follow along with all of the different experiences and all of the different um, people of note that perhaps in, in, influence Mr. Barrett. Um, and of course, one of the more important ones is very likely James Joyce. Uh, the next thing we discuss is the planning aspect of Mr. Barrett. And uh, this planning aspect, of course, is, is worded within uh, Iggy's interview that we discussed in the last two episodes of Peeling Sid Barrett, uh, 38 and 39, I believe. You can go back and check that out. But that planning aspect is an indicator to me of a, a wonderful mind that is, that is creating art kind of like as a, instead of a ready-made, it's kind of a thoughty made it's, it's, it's something that shows uh, quite a bit of consideration and planning and knowledge of art and presentation and poetry and ties all those things together quite wonderfully. The next theme is uh, scientific names. Now this is something that I noticed early on and we didn't have a whole lot of uh, examples of this. It seems to be something that's earlier in his music where he's referencing Latin names for things and it just kind of goes away. He doesn't really seem to be using it very much in, in later music. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. It was just a pattern that I was tracking, and uh, I'd have to admit that that one seems kind of um, kind of minimal as, as a takeaway from this series. The next one is for abbreviations and nicknames, which I kind of picked up on later on, that uh, he was using abbreviations for words and that he was making anagrams. So 
as we mentioned, the Barrett versus Rabbit type of possible anagram. And uh, phonetically, anyway, not not necessarily just by interpolation of or exchanging letters, but also phonetically the sounds of those letters is something that he seems to be doing for some reason. Perhaps it's just fun. Perhaps it's fun for him to do that, so he is choosing to do that. I don't know. You'll have to decide that on the room on your own. Uh, another. Uh, theme that we mentioned is influence of other bands on him. So Velvet Underground, Bob Dylan, The Doors. I'll also throw in another one, of course, which would possibly be the Rolling Stones. I haven't done Did Sid Rolling Stones yet. I hope to do that eventually. But uh, it is possible, of course. And one of the corrections I want to make here is that uh, we discussed Dark Globe. And in that, in that song, we mentioned that uh, one of the lyrics is uh, promised... Uh, a stone from your heart, which is an interesting, and, and we discussed that thoroughly in, in our Peeling Sid Barrett Dark Globe episode. I just want to point out uh, that, of course, the Rolling Stones did a song called Heart of Stone. You'll never break this heart of stone. So you have to wonder if, you know, he isn't taking a part of that um, song and reusing it here, or perhaps pointing to that song deliberately. Uh, I don't know exactly what's going on there. Perhaps he was quite influenced by the Rolling Stones in some way. But uh, we'll see. I'll break those down. And in my mind, uh, of course, it is possible that the Rolling Stones kind of lost their writer. And perhaps even um, prior to that, uh, Mr. Barrett may have been uh, working with the Stones. And we discussed that a little bit in an earlier episode. I can't remember which one. Where... Uh, there's a documented meeting between them when uh, Mr. Barrett, before Mr. Barrett had even started out with Pink Floyd. So a little bit of a strange interaction there. Uh, the last theme that I'll kind of discuss is his childhood review. And of course, the childhood review and the development of the person is important in the development of understanding, of self-understanding within all people for us to understand the influences of our life to understand the impact other people have had on us, and uh, perhaps he's doing that in his own way. I don't have a whole lot uh, else to say about that other than to note that perhaps he's he's going through that process, and that may be a reason why he's making these childhood, childhood uh, references. Uh, of course, it is also possible, I would just like to point out, that Mr. Barrett may have been stuck in a particular point in time in his life, which would be quite a dangerous thing, he may have been stuck in a point in time where he was happy or happiest, and that may have been when he was young as a child and perhaps uh, in a first love kind of a situation, an awakening love situation, and perhaps uh, he may have been damaged by the fact, of course, that all of us eventually have to move on from that and, tr and, and try to live adult lives. <laughs> so... Uh, that can be a very difficult process for people to go through, of course, because we, we have to give up so many things in order to uh, start adulting in, in our life. But, of course, that's inevitable, and uh, the transitions that we make through life are inevitable in many ways. And there are benefits to them, of course. Uh, it's not all negative. So, um, those are pretty much my conclusions about the themes now so let's consider some questions that people might have about Mr. Barrett and perhaps we can answer some questions so uh, one of the questions people have of course is you know did Mr. Barrett just have a mental breakdown and eventually want to leave the group and with our review I think you can tell that there are very many influences um, that are possible and very many possible reasons why Mr. Barrett would want to move on. Uh, not all of them tie in with mental health. Of course, it is entirely possible that he had problems with mental health, but in our review, we pointed out the constant references to uh, uh, sadness at failed relationships. Uh, it's quite evident that he was planning quite grandiose uh, works of art to some degree. How far he progressed them is hard to know. And perhaps he's just a private person by nature. There are, there are indicators, of course, 
uh, throughout his career that he could be quite private. So uh, that may be a, a quite an overblown aspect to the legend of Mr. Barrett, that, uh, that he was just this person that spiraled into drug abuse and um, mental health and mental health concerns and was never able to recover. <clears throat> Um, I guess that's, I guess that's pretty much it. You know, I, I wanted to put together this and consider all those things and perhaps it's a good time now for me to, um, discuss some of my takeaways, not just from my review of Mr. Barrett, and I'm not doing it just as a review of Mr. Barrett, but also to try and capture, uh, what some of the ideals were of the time to correct problems of the time and also to apply them to our time now and see you know kind of what's happening now to understand how the world uh, is how the world could be better how I can make it better and how I can kind of try to navigate this world that is in my opinion becoming a more and more difficult world to navigate and that's been quite a bit of consideration. So I'm going to run through about 11 points now. I'm going to say 11, 12 points. These are my takeaways now. I'm just going to share them with you uh, out of fairness. Uh, I, whether a person chooses to go along with this and read it the same way is totally up to you. Okay, But I'm just going to throw this out. These are my considerations with my background, my personal background, considering things uh, with Mr. Barrett. And considering things with the 60s and um, these are kind of my takeaways so uh, before I get started with that one of the things that I want to discuss is that uh, mr. Chappelle just came out with a special and a lot of people are, are discussing this recently it's his uh, Chappelle closer special and he has a number of things that he says in there that have upset the LGBTQ community community and I would argue that um, in my opinion, a number of people are upset within that community with Mr. Chappelle for a very good reason. And uh, that is that he does not seem to be educated on the topic. Uh, this is, he, he uses the closer, he makes a number of good points. And uh, I have mentioned in my introduction that I have a lot of respect for Mr. Chappelle. Uh, I think he is a wonderful comedian and not only comedian but artist and also philosopher but he is missing something on this particular topic and that is that this is something outside of his experience directly and um, he says something that indicates that he doesn't understand it he says that uh, I'm paraphrasing here now he says that a person is born uh, sex or gender is a fact now, any person with any form of biological education or background knows that the gender within humans is not a fact. Uh, it is not one slash two. There has always been a history within humanity of hermaphroditism. And you can look up what a hermaphrodite is if you're not aware of what a hermaphrodite is. All I'm saying is that there is what people would consider to be fully expressed male. Now I'm just discussing physically. And this is all tied to chemical development, hormonal development of a fetus. Let's say a scale from 1 to 100. 1 would be fully male and 100 would be fully female. Now, uh, most people are born somewhere on that scale. And that scale, I would like to point out, is numerically infinite. In other words... There are infinite subdivisions between 10 and 11. 10.5, 10.49, 10.4999, etc. There are infinite separations on that scale of 1 to 100. Therefore, there are infinite expressions on that scale of male to female. All you know is that a person that is born is a person. And I want to say that one more time. A person that is born is a person. They are not a gender. A gender is something that comes along with that person, and it can change, of course, over time. And I'm not saying that <clears throat> because that's my own opinion. <clears throat> I'm saying that because that happens in the world. 
uh, particularly when we're discussing the complexity of human society and the complexity of humans, that can be something that is quite f fluid. And uh, I think it's disingenuous of people that have not become uh, knowledgeable on that topic to judge people that are going through that process. I myself have never gone through that process. I would never dream of telling someone that they are definitely one of these two things. When it is quite clear to me that biologically that is not the case, not only are people ex expressing things physically, just physically now, not mentally, I'm not getting into the whole mental discussion, which is an entirely much more complicated discussion. Any person with a biological background knows that there is a very um, complex expression of gender within almost all animals. So uh, this idea that someone is born with a gender, no. Someone is born with what they have, a body. Every person is born with a body, congratulations. Imagine classifying people by the amount of hair on their body. That's essentially what people are doing. Classifying people by the amount of hair on their body. Okay, you're born with hair on your body. Every person is born with hair on the body. Congratulations. Well, not everybody. Some people are born hairless, I guess. But my point is, is that this entire discussion seems to be something that uh, he doesn't entirely understand. And as such, um, I'm not entirely certain what he was trying to do with, with his discussion. I did get the feel that he was uh, deliberately trolling people, uh, not just with that discussion, but with previous discussions uh, in that in that uh, routine. And that may have been his intent, was to cause uh, discussion, to cause consideration of these topics by trolling in a way. So perhaps that's what's going on. I, I don't know. Okay. So anyway, that I feel that that is, is kind of done. I will just reiterate the points that every person is born with a body. Every person uh, is born with some form of gender expression. Uh, how they choose to live their life, in my opinion, is a much more complicated thing. The infinite expressions of body and gender are, of course, uh, unique. And, of course, every person is unique and deserves to be treated as unique. And for some reason, people seem to think that every person doesn't have the right to be unique. And uh, I don't know if that's a modern thing or what, but it's a very strange thing, in my opinion, to think that every person wouldn't have the entitled right to be treated as unique. Uh, there are numerous reasons why this is an issue, and uh, I, I'll point out that in a number of Western societies, we're seeing increase in um, depression and other negative things, and in my opinion, those tie in with the lack of ability of people to be expressive and creative and self-identify, and that uh, is something that should be corrected. Okay. So let's run through a number of points that are kind of takeaways from this era that I'm going to try to tie to um, other things. With this era, with the context, and these are my takeaways, again, um, feel free to use these or consider them as you please. The first is, of course, we've mentioned a number of uh, religious aspects or backgrounds to Mr. Barrett and also the inclusion of other uh, belief sets within what would be considered to be a standard, in my opinion, Western uh, Christian background, which sometimes involves some pagan influences, etc. Uh, one of them is the development of the importance of having a vegan diet. Now, this is incredibly important to me. Not that every person is vegan, but every person perhaps understands the dangers of a number of things. Now, I will point you to a book. Um, and that book is titled How Not to Die, and that book is written by, I'll give you the information here, Michael Greger, MD, with Gene Stone, by uh, Flat Iron Books, and I'll try to give you, a, I'm not sure, a date on a copyright. At any rate, this uh, doctor runs through a number of things that uh, he recognizes, and he provides all the background information. Uh, how Not to Die, Discover the Foods Scientifically Proven to Prevent and Reverse Disease. 
Uh, this is important for a number of reasons, not least of which is that our food has become increasingly tainted, uh, not only by antibiotic treatment, but also by uh, the food that we feed to our food, and also the pesticide use, and the consumptions of plastics. All of these things are very, very problematic to human health, and interestingly enough, uh, to uh, human fetal gender development. And I will uh, link a video, I believe it was an, uh, an interview with a specialist on this, and she specifically goes through how um, endocrine, endocrine disruptors will impact the human fetus, and particularly the male fetus. So if you're not familiar with that topic, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, link that video. But for now, let's just keep this simple. For each person's health right now, in my opinion, it is important that we try to grow as much of our own food as possible and to keep it organic, and particularly when a fetus is developing. So um, there are a number of reasons for this, and there are a number of benefits for living this kind of a lifestyle, not least of which is that growing your own food is uh, quite rewarding, and in fact, the food tastes better. So if you grow your own tomatoes, you know this already, tomatoes are exceedingly easy to grow. And a store-bought tomato is picked before it has, has had time to develop and become sweet, and it's also treated with chemicals. If you grow your own tomatoes, um, it's a very simple thing to do. It's a very small investment. It's a rewarding experience, and the tomatoes are much, much better than anything you're going to get in a grocery store. And that's true with almost everything that you will grow. The benefit of a vegan lifestyle is also discussed by Mr. Gregor in his book, but I'll explain it somewhat here. Um, there is a compiling effect of toxins within uh, animals. So, and, and this doesn't even get into the impact of disease and antibiotic treatments when you pack animals together. I'm just discussing the flow of toxin through the environment. So we have a, uh, let's say, a pesticide that's, or an antifungal that's being sprayed on plants so that those plants can be grown and then fed to animals. Those animals will build that up and then when you eat that animal, you're getting a, a higher dose of those chemicals. Now just consider, I just want to throw this, uh, kind of throw this out there. They tell us that we should wash our food to clean it of pesticides. Somehow, washing with water is supposed to remove pesticides from our food. That's interesting because um, it rains. And if water flowing over a plant is sufficient to remove pesticides, then every time it rains, farmers would have to respray pesticide on their plants. But they don't have to do that because those pesticides have been formulated to stick to plants. So, um, by all means, feel free to wash your food, but please, if you're considerate of your health, try to eat organic food, try to grow your own plants. You can grow your own greens. It's very easy to do. They will be organic, they will be much more healthy for you, and they will be lacking in pesticides. <clears throat> okay. Now, I'm not saying go totally vegan. That's something that's quite alien to uh, most people. I'm just saying try to limit that as much as you can and try to be considerate of the type of meats that you will eat so that you can avoid problems. And, of course, everyone knows the, diff the, uh, the problems with processed meats. That's quite well known. Uh, I won't go into all of that. I'll just point out that uh, there are things you can eat, like um, uh, for me... Personally, I, I, I don't digest meat very well. Something I can eat is eggs, chicken eggs. So I like to eat uh, organic chicken eggs, uh, free-range chicken eggs. Now, of course, this, <clears throat> this stuff all costs more, and this is a problem, because um, the ability of the average Western person to purchase valuable food or value-added food has been decreasing over time. 
Uh, there, are, there are numerous breakdowns of the stagnation of pay versus inflation over the last 50 years within Western societies, particularly within the U.S. So the purchasing power of the average U.S. citizen has continued to decline, which is causing a lot of problems. But as much as possible, I will suggest that people try to be mindful of uh, the food that they're eating. And um, that's one of the takeaways I have from that whole vegan idea. Another takeaway um, that I have from this, this era of the 60s is the importance of the environment um, and the importance now of recycling. Now, there are a lot of problems with recycling. I'm not going to pretend that there aren't. But there also are a lot of problems with people that are just dumping plastic in the trash. So as much as possible, if you look on the bottom of your uh, plastic containers, you'll see a number that's in kind of a triangle with arrows on it. It'll have like a one or a two on it. Normally, those are very recyclable materials. If you see or one or two, please make sure that you recycle those things. <clears throat> um, another takeaway that I have is that uh, from the hippie movement in general is that people should start considering to limit their consumption and try to live smaller and this is one way of course of getting around the energy crisis that we're experiencing right now um, people are using ridiculous amounts of energy and quite often it's it's um, for minimal value added things but uh, I guess you could argue that it takes more energy to make a book than to play a video game if you're just going to be measuring energy. At any rate, um, this is kind of a problem in, in how to limit consumption. And, and why is it that every person thinks that the way to solve this problem is by finding a new way to consume things instead of stopping the overconsumption? For example, um, the medical field always... Um, not always, I shouldn't say that, but generally speaking, uh, if you watch commercials on TV, always trying to sell products, and of course the medical field is no different. If a person is struggling with weight, there are a lot of pills and procedures you can do um, to correct that, that are again products, things to be consumed or things to buy. Instead of telling people stop consuming and stop and stop buying and uh, find ways or um, providing people with ways of distracting or changing their mind so that they can become creative and expressive and enjoy life and uh, kind of rewire their own brain so that they are able to live a, a simpler life that is a more healthy life and to simply consume less. Um, obviously that's not in the vested interest of people that are trying to sell things. So uh, you're not gonna see that on the majority of shows or discussions that people make because uh, this is part of the reason why I wanted to make this series is because uh, I knew that there were aspects of pop culture, consumption culture that are portrayed on media like this and I wanted to have a contrary kind of a point of view and hopefully that would ring true with some people and they would um, perhaps feel strengthened in their viewpoint. Uh, the next topic is a messy one. It is about uh, politics. You know, the politics of, uh, of split societies and the uh, introduction of power. Now, of course, the 60s was a time of struggle with power, um, an attempt to generate what I guess you could call uh, an empowerment of every citizen versus uh, vested um, interests of people that were perhaps trying to take advantage of the average citizen. I feel that this is a very important thing that's happening right now, and uh, particularly in the U.S. I'm not really aware of U.K. politics, and I'll just be focusing on politics in the U.S. Right now, 
the United States has a very significant problem, in my opinion, that we have two political parties that are playing good cop, bad cop with their own citizens, and they are they seem to be quite comfortable with the maintenance of their own power, and in spite of their constant sniping and their constant vilification of one another, they are in fact completely in control of uh, and, and of the political process, and they are pushing other parties out. So I, I like to be a forward-thinking person. Uh, this has caused a lot of problems, I believe. Um, a lot of people like to point to what the uh, founding fathers wanted, and they don't seem to point out that uh, people like George Washington specifically said not to have political parties. They specifically said not to do this, and it was a bad idea. And in my opinion, it has to be removed. The reason for that is because it's very easy to unify and be controlled and manipulated by money when you're dealing just with a party. And the party can control its own members, and those members will no longer be able to exist or represent individually, or it limits their ability to, to do so. So how can, how can the average person change that situation? The answer is very simple. Do not vote for the two parties. When you vote, vote for anyone else, from left to right, from conservative to liberal, however you want, but do not vote for those two parties. When that happens, those two parties will have to split and they will break up and that will finally remove this binary equation that has stuck the United States in a, a political quagmire of ridiculous thought and stagnation for the last 50 years. That's my opinion, but uh, I'll just add that one in. Once that has been accomplished politically, it will be much more easy to enact change throughout the political process. And by change, I mean, of course, one of the most important things is the removal of power of money, the remover of, of the power of the lobbyists, so that so that individual representatives will be more responsive to their to the the people that they represent and it will be easier to get through other legislation that does things like redistrict so that uh, there's a more even uh, vote set within each representative's area instead of having this gerrymandering problem that, that the United States has now which both parties have contributed to by the way Another political change that's required in the United States, at least in my opinion, is that uh, we already have minimum age requirements. Uh, I believe we also need to have maximum age requirements. And that's not necessarily tied to the deterioration of people as they age, although that is something that happens and it's undesirable. It more ties in with the fact that in the United States, it takes 10 to 15 years to prosecute someone for illegal activity or criminal activity. Therefore, if someone is serving already and they're 70 years old, they can reasonably expect to never face charges for any crimes committed while operating as a politician. So that is entirely uh, undesirable. And it, and it does, in fact, apply to many facets of uh, society and uh, to the elderly that they can reasonably expect to, at, say, the age, of, the age of 70, to pretty much do what they want. And uh, that that uh, freedom is desirable provided the person is, uh, is a reliable, trustworthy, and honorable person. But when you're dealing with an empowered criminal in the age, at the age of 70, if they become uh, political representatives or uh, fulfill other roles, they are able to do exceedingly large amounts of damage that benefit perhaps themselves, perhaps other friends, or perhaps even members of their own family, and they will never reasonably face charges for their criminal activity, which is very, very destructive to the fabric of a society. So that risk, in my opinion, is, is simply not worth the benefits of it. So that's, in my opinion, that's those are things that really need to happen. Um, the next point that I want to uh, kind of discuss is tied to the idea of uh, limiting consumption and that is that people need to limit debt and right now you can go to usadebtclock.org whatever you can see how much the country owes and of course if you are older than 16 
and you pay attention, you notice that both political parties love to spin the country into oblivion. All they want to do, it appears, is send as much money as possible to the people that back them when they're in power. And that money is, of course, <laughs> money that we're all on the hook for, that major companies don't actually have to pay that much taxes on. So uh, they have managed through their own lobbyists to remove themselves from the tax code, which is, in my opinion, a form of sedition that the very, very wealthy are choosing not to support the country. It is a form of sedition. They have, met, they have uh, manipulated legal codes so that they do not have to pay their fair share of taxes. They have chosen to thrust that on the American citizen, the average American citizen. It is ruining the lives of American people, and they don't care. So uh, that is, in my opinion, uh, a very significant problem. And so long as these two parties stay in power, that will not be cleaned up. They'll continue to obfuscate through, I don't know, thousand page documents. The fact that they're, they're covering for large corporations. So the limiting of debt uh, is an important aspect to maintain freedom and to maintain a freedom of voice. I remember when I was young that uh, people used to quit their jobs quite regularly. And now you see people quitting their jobs. <laughs> Now, uh, what's funny to me is that people in, I'm going to say, uh, the late 70s would quit their jobs uh, quite frequently. They'd get upset with someone or upset with their boss. They'd quit the job. They could go find a new job. But for the last 40 years, that hasn't been the experience. People have been uh, stuck at jobs. They've been mistreated. Uh, I've experienced this. A number of my friends have experienced this. And uh, this runs the gamut from uh, schooling, um, where, where the experience of college not only is, is ridiculously absorbent in cost, but also um, is completely unserving to the individual and is selling something that is of limited value when a, uh, when a job market is simply not there and it's known that it's not there so uh, the ability of an individual to limit debt to live a simple life to perhaps become a craftsman or perhaps uh, find ways of uh, producing money through uh, who knows going to farmers markets and living a simple life doing these things is a, a possibility to remove debt and and retain freedom on a on a personal level uh, another topic that I would like to discuss is the danger of drug use and this isn't just like tied up in the the very very physically dangerous aspects of drug use uh, one of the largest problems and I'll, I'll give a link to uh, I'll probably give a couple links to the history of drug related murders happening in Mexico uh, this, the United States appetite for drug abuse has been fueling the growth and abuse of gangs all over the world, in particular in South America and in uh, Latin America, Central America, and in Mexico. So a lot of Americans look at Mexico and they blame the government for corruption. They blame all these things, but they do not blame themselves for abusing drugs and funneling money to criminal organizations through their own drug use on a daily basis. This is a very important thing, of course, because one of the most important and valuable things people have in a capitalist system is what they choose to buy. And if a person chooses to buy and fund criminal activity, they should not be surprised when that criminal activity becomes violent. And that will not stay in one area. If you have criminal activity and gang activity, that uh, that I guess you could say confederation of people will seek to exert power as far as it can exert it and of course that will cross borders and the, the United States has its own history of criminal organizations whether that's gone away or not is up to every person's uh, own opinion now uh, the next topic I'd like to discuss is uh, global warming 
the danger of global warming. And now if you follow through a number of the steps that I've already discussed, um, in my opinion, that'll be helping. But if you live in the eastern United States, east of the Mississippi, please realize that the entire eastern United States used to be a forest. Everything east of the Mississippi received enough rainfall to have a forest that has been completely removed. This is exceedingly dangerous because it leads to the desertification of land, the destruction of its potentiality. And uh, one of the things that you can do if you live east of the Mississippi is plant some trees, plant some plants that are native to the area on your land. And if you do so, it seems like a small thing, but if enough people did that, uh, and I'll just maybe throw up sizes of like Eastern United States versus Brazil. Everyone talks about the Brazilian rainforest, which is a tragedy that's unfolding, but no one talks about the tragedy that has already unfolded and the destruction of the United States forest. And we, uh, as Americans, we should be fully aware of the destruction of that forest. Now, actually changing uh, global warming uh, on a global scale is going to require a lot more than people just planting trees in the eastern United States. Obviously, um, there's going to need to be other forms of energies that are that are uh, utilized, uh, wind, solar, and hydropower. Actually, hydropower is exceedingly clean, and it also develops reservoirs, which in some areas are extremely necessary due to the uh, changing weather patterns that we're seeing right now. So. Uh, ideally, we would utilize those three, and that brings me to my eighth point, which is that nuclear power in its present form, unless, uh, unless some significant changes happen to the nuclear power industry, it needs to be completely removed worldwide. And uh, that is because of the instability of governments and people to regulate not just nuclear power itself, but also the nuclear waste associated with it that can last up to 30,000 years or longer. Now, uh, a representative Kennedy discussed this, I'll link it. Um, people do not seem to understand the vast amounts of energy um, and money required to fund the nuclear industry. Obviously, the nuclear industry has its own lobbyists. It is its, it is its own animal and it tends to toot its own horn as being something that's more environmental friendly. Uh, no, it is not. And the reason it is not is because it is infinitely expensive and it has um, significant health risks for an extended period of time. And if there is a, a form of uh, unforeseen circumstance with that specific type of energy, which obviously happened in Japan and can happen anywhere, then you will see uh, vast areas of the world and perhaps the entire world at some point in time become uh, dangerous to life. And uh, that's not only because of direct radiation, it, it can involve uh, um, damage to water tables. So, uh, and we're seeing that already in the United States. I realize that if there is a significant rise in sea level, uh, that a number of areas that will become inundated with water could see seawater or salt water uh, on containers that were supposed to last and they're not lasting. And this, there are places, I'll, I'll, link, I'll link a place, uh, uh, an article here that discusses an island that was utilized for this very, very purpose and uh, was just kind of concreted over whatever else. Um, that waste is not going to go away. Recognize 30,000 years is like seven times human re recorded history. So the chances of people controlling all that waste are significantly less. Now, there are forms of nuclear power that will utilize old waste, which are ex which is extremely useful. So if the nuclear industry wants to validate itself, and if the nuclear industry wants to provide solutions for the world, it needs to embrace these technologies and make them work. Otherwise, it needs to go away in my opinion. Um, another thing that I would like to kind of discuss is uh, the problem with with uh, churches and financing right now. Obviously there's quite a bit of corruption within uh, significant churches in the United States. It's very disturbing to me. 
uh, that uh, people that are not interested in the spiritual development of their own followers are utilizing their positions to financially fleece them. And for that reason, uh, of, of course, I don't know about other places, but in the United States, churches are not taxed in the same way religions are not taxed in the same way other businesses are. But if a church is going to handle money, in my opinion, it needs to be taxed because at that point it becomes a business. Now, if, uh, if churches want to meet in people's houses, if they want to meet in other areas and discuss topics that are important to, the, to that group of people, that's totally fine. There's no reason for anyone to be involved with that, and there's no reason to limit people's actual practice of religion. However, once churches start to handle money, distribute money, and consolidate power and consolidate land, they are behaving like a business. They need to be treated like a business by the government. And uh, I know a lot of people won't agree with that, but um, sorry, that's just my personal viewpoint. And I hope that at some point in time, the government figures out how it's going to handle that problem because it is a significant problem in my opinion. So um, I suppose that's pretty much all the major points that I'm coming away from uh, with this review of the 60s, with this review of the movement of uh, the subterraneans, with things that may relay to why someone like Mr. Barrett uh, put together the music the way he did. I'm not saying that he uh, agreed with or, or uh, endorsed any of these uh, points that I've just made, but certainly these are all points that were being grappled with by people at the time and in the 60s. And I do have to consider um, that it was, I, in my opinion anyway, it was a worthwhile effort. I don't know that uh, things obviously uh, were fixed. And part of the reason for that may have been distractions with things like the drug movement and uh, the empty nihilistic uh, viewpoints of uh, folks that were involved with that that may have uh, short-circuited that, that kind of a movement. So, uh, I suppose I, I, I should kind of discuss one last thing, at least in the United States, and that is the vast amount of military spending that has been occurring. It is quite evident to anyone, I guess, that's been paying attention that the nature of future warfare is not tied directly to um, strong militaries, uh, World War II style nations kind of duking it out. It's moved on to things like IT and uh, and uh, financial fighting. So uh, really, in my opinion, um, the need to have IT security is, is extremely significant. Um, and that ties in not just with business, but also defense. And finally, also with political systems, of course, because if we have a secure uh, internet, things like direct voting on specific topics is then possible. And of course, we have a representative form of government because voting on things consistently was not something that was possible before. Uh, but it is something that is possible now. We could have large nationwide referendums on very specific topics um, monthly, say, and people could vote on those and those could be tallied in a few days and we could have the voting of uh, of an actual democratic directly democratic process now in my opinion you cannot remove in, in its entirety representative government um, because you still have to have that kind of direct direction but uh, it would be possible with an, an actually secure network to eventually have a more direct form and a more rewarding form of democracy which of course would in my opinion, potentially involve people much, much more than is currently happening. Because in, in the United States anyway, we, we usually around 50% voting. So about half of the citizens don't even bother to participate in the political process, which is really a shame to me. So uh, I've gone through a lot of things. I don't know if I covered everything that I wanted to, but I've gone on quite long enough. Uh, as I mentioned, um, those points are my own points. They are not necessarily tied with Mr. Barrett. I don't know if that's something that bothered him. There are indications that perhaps he was considering things like 
uh, damage to the earth and other uh, items of interest. But uh, to my knowledge, he never directly participated or stated much about those things. Uh, certainly, people in the 60s felt empowered enough to at least discuss them. So uh, perhaps it's worth talking about here in this form. So um, I guess that's, that's pretty much it. I, I consider the entirety of Mr. Barrett's work. I do wonder, there's a part of me that wonders if he wasn't trying to uh, give a certain um, roadmap for people to self-develop, to make them considerate of one another, to help engender uh, a sense of empathy, um, not just interpersonal, but also international, as a form of empathy uh, between people so that uh, we could perhaps move on to some other form of existence, one that involves people having more freedom um, so that they can experience and create and beautify their own lives and live a full life. I, there are only so many possible motivations for each person in this world. Uh, and some people at this point, in my opinion, have a very limited view of what they can do with their life on this earth. And for me anyway, uh, the time that we have is very valuable and needs to be used to try and do things that perhaps we think we might be able to do, but we're not certain of. And that's part of the reason why I put together this series, because I felt uh, compelled to provide a greater story, to provide context, um, to give insight perhaps to some folks that uh, their life can be meaningful and, and quite uh, significantly larger perhaps than uh, they believe currently that it can be. And that by giving our time and our work, uh, not just throwing money at problems, you know, not just taking five dollars and, and giving it, which is nice. I mean, that's great. Don't get me wrong. But there is a next step. And that next step is to actively become participants in the world around us to mold the world to be what we think it should be like and the first step in that really is to self-realize and to begin to value uh, the things that are important to us so here's an example of what I mean if I say to you where is the Holy Land where is the Holy Land the vast majority of people will say the Holy Land is uh, in the Middle East but uh, for many people the Holy Land is wherever they are and of course uh, in, a, in the United States uh, a significant amount of tribes have been uh, regrettably uh, victimized and had their land stolen from them and this is regrettable not just because it affected them but also because it affected the land if people view their own land as as a resource to be exploited and not as something that is holy or incredibly important and tied to them, they will not treat that land with respect, they will not be careful, they will not engender health within that environment, they will not have long-term thinking, they will not be married to the land, which is of course very important to the development of, uh, of the entirety of a society over time. So in my opinion, when someone asks someone from the United States, where is the Holy Land? Their very first statement should be, it's here, it's the United States. And if I ask someone in Wales um, or Ireland, where's the Holy Land? They should say immediately Wales or Ireland. Of course, if you're Christian or a Muslim or whatever other religion, there are other connotations associated with that that are specifically religious in nature. But the, but the innate connection between people and their environment should be recognized as of primary importance and for that reason, wherever they are should be viewed as a holy land. So, um, I guess I've gone on long enough. I, I wanted to discuss all these things. I hope this has been worthwhile for for everyone. I hope that uh, there, are, there are different ways of looking at problems for everyone now. I hope that this is something that has uh, maybe engendered in other people at least the idea that perhaps... They are capable of making wonderful things that uh, would be valuable to themselves, but also to other people. 
And that, of course, is the whole point of art and artistic expression. And perhaps that's uh, something that uh, Mr. Barrett was trying to teach everyone. I don't know. But that's it for now. Um, thanks again for checking out the series. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. And I will talk to you later.